In these lessons so far, we've focused on weather fundamentals, but one question I get a lot is how we actually forecast the weather. And it basically all revolves around computers and the technology that they're able to provide. So the first step, with or without technology and forecasting the weather, is always understanding what's happening right now. That means looking at satellite information, where there are clouds, radar information, where there's rain or snow, and looking at ground reports. Very often I'll look at reports from all the airports to see what's actually going on with temperature, with the wind, with the dew point. You really have to have a good understanding of what's happening now if you want to know what's happening next. Once you have that good background with what's happening now, you can start looking at the computer models. There are dozens and dozens of computer models, essentially different scenarios that computers think will play out in terms of our forecast. Each one is always a little bit different. These computers are doing a ton of calculations to spit out these projections. We're talking heavy duty physics and calculus. These equations could not be done by hand. That's why we need these supercomputers to model the atmosphere. But how do you know which one's going to be correct? That's where our insight as professionals comes in. So we'll look at all of these different models, assess what we know about each model. If you watch them long enough, you know that there are certain biases in some situations. We'll apply that information. And very often in our head, we kind of blend the models together to come up with we think will be the right solution in terms of a forecast. Now, a couple of these models are more well-known than others. You may have heard about the quote-unquote American model. That would be the GFS. And the European model, that's the model that comes from a group of European countries. Now, the European historically has better performance than the American GFS model, and people are always asking why that is. It has to do with funding. Basically, in Europe, you have to pay for the data that you get from this model, so there's more money going into its continued development. Meanwhile, on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, the GFS is taxpayer-funded, so you're reliant upon government funds to build up the computing power. And it is getting better. That's the good news. More money is going into it, but because it's free and taxpayer-funded, it doesn't have the same resources that the European has. It's really just that simple. The European model is definitely still the benchmark model to look at. Doesn't mean it's always right, but it means it's more often than not going to give you a better sense than another model might. There are another type of model here that we look at. They're called ensembles. Basically, these are models that take the starting point in the atmosphere and they'll tweak one or two things. So let's say the temperature right now is 52. One model will change that and make the current temperature 51. Another will make it 53, maybe 55. Maybe add more clouds to what's happening now. Basically tweaking the environment right now, assuming that we're never fully able to get a great picture of what's happening even now, because we don't have observations all over the world. There are obviously gaps. Our measurements might be off a little bit. So you tweak these starting variables, and then you say to the model, OK, let it rip and then you see how each model plays out. Each one will be a little bit different because you tweak those starting variables. These are ensembles, and you can run 25, 50 of these, even more in some cases, and then you get an average, and that's usually a good way to blend out some uncertainty. So there's a host of this information that we're looking at all the time, and it's up to us as meteorologists to sift through it to try to give you the best forecast possible.